All right, so I'm going to go ahead and open up our session uh, this evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is Illini Arrow Connections, um, a day in the life. So this series was started as a way to bridge that gap between our students and our alumni and give you a look at some, um, some topics that maybe aren't covered in your curriculum, things that we think would be really valuable for students to know um, before they leave campus. So uh, Samantha McHugh is on. Samantha is a 2012 graduate of aerospace engineering, and she is also um, one of the coordinators of this uh, session and, and helps come up with the, the topics and reaches out to all of, all of our alumni to get the speakers. So thank you uh, so much, Samantha, for all your work. And, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right, perfect. Thanks, Courtney. So uh, let's get started and just uh, let our alums here do a little intro about yourself. Um, Derek, if you want to kick it off, give us your brief bio. Hey, Derek, you are- I see it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Derek Ford. I'm a senior staff engineer at Carbon Aerospace down here in Texas. Um, I graduated from the University of Illinois in 93 with my bachelor's in aeronautical engineering. And then I got a master's in aeronautical engineering. And I completed uh, the coursework for a PhD before I decided to start working. <laughs> I've been working for about um, 25 years in the industry. 23 of those years have been as a stress analyst on various programs, um, which include uh, the V-22, F-35, Gulfstream programs, uh, CF-6 sales, and I've worked with composites and metallic structures in that time. Great. Thank you, Florin. Go ahead. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right. So I'm Florin Gannett. Uh, I am a test engineer at Blue Origin. Been at Blue Origin for about three years, and so I work test operations of the mm -hmm. B3PM and B3U Hydrolox engines. Um, I graduated from U of I in 2018 with my bachelor's in aerospace. Um, and outside of that, I just grew up just outside Chicago. Uh, I actually grew up in Romania and emigrated to the U.S. when I was eight years old. So. More of a recent graduate. <laughs> All right, Nihar. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Nihar Gandhi. Uh, I am a 2012 graduate from the University of Illinois, uh, obviously aerospace engineering. Um, I currently work at a company called Archer Aviation, uh, working on elect electric VTOL aircraft uh, in the GNC space. Um, and then previously I've worked at Boeing as well as uh, a couple of other startups uh, and, uh, and aerospace funded startups in Silicon Valley. So kind of got a, a little bit of variety of experiences here I can share with you guys here. All right, and Scott. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Newhoff. Uh, I graduated from U of I in, uh, in 2016. And then I graduated with uh, my master's also in aerospace from Stanford in uh, 2019. And uh, I'm now a, a, an aerospace engineer at NASA Ames Research Center uh, in Silicon Valley, where I work in the uh, computational aerosciences branch. So I mainly do uh, like CFD analysis. I've done CFD analysis on uh, various launch environment uh, applications and also on uh, acoustics, this sort of thing. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So I think we want to kick it off. Um, if you can think back to bachelor degree days when you were taking all your coursework, junior and senior years, kind of when you start to really get all of the you know, core aerospace classes. And I, that tends to be the time when you begin to really like some things and really dislike other things. At least that was my experience. Um, so I'm curious about you guys kind of talking about your your thoughts on how you transitioned from, you know, picking an area that you like best and going into the workforce and pursuing that area. Um, and, uh, you know, basically, why did you end up there after school? Was it an area you liked or did the job just happen and you ended up having to do it and you liked it? And, and how's that progressed from there? And uh, Derek, we'll start with you.
Was this me? I can't hear now. Yeah, can, can you, you guys... hear me? Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, well, my first two years, we were just kind of bouncing around and trying to figure out what type of engineer you wanted to be. Um, and my third year, I had some courses that uh, I think it was a, a spaceship course. <laughs> and basically, you had to have a team that designed a spaceship. And we were kind of put into different disciplines you know who's going to do propulsion who's going to do avionics who's going to do structures and nobody really wanted to do the structures at that time <laughs> so i said all right you know what i'll do it so i did the structures and this was something that i kind of had a knack for in my life anyway i used to make model rockets and make i don't know if you guys did this too but styrofoam airplanes that type of thing and it's just something that seemed to connect more with me as time went on. So if I can peg it back to something, it was basically that class where I had to use those skills to, to help myself get a decent grade. So on my end, I think I'm pretty fortunate that I kind of always gravitated towards propulsion. It was something that I've always been interested in. It was just playing with fire as a little kid kind of did it <laughs> and uh it just kind of stuck through throughout and, and when I came to U of I I, I was like okay where can I take the fluids classes we're gonna take the computational classes where can I play with fire and do all that stuff and and then like when I, I think flows it just solidified that's that's what I love to do and that's what I wanted to do and it just kind of carried over through a few um, I had a co-op with SpaceX where I went and did testing out in McGregor, integrated Falcon 9 stage testing. And like, as soon as I saw Merlin hot fire, I was like, yep, this is what I want to do forever. So uh, it's kind of just ended up that I, I think I got pretty lucky. And, and outside of school, uh, I saw a job opening for Blue Origin in van middle of nowhere. And they're like, you want to come on and just test rocket engines all day? And I was like, sounds perfect. So how it was, it was, it was I, I guess I got lucky that I never had to like really sit down and think about it, it just all worked out. Yeah, on, uh, on my side, I guess I'd always imagined myself as sort of going into aerodynamics. That was always in my mind, like the core of aerospace engineering and something that I, I always thought I would really enjoy. Uh, once I actually started taking some flow classes, I realized, hey, maybe this isn't, this isn't really as fun as I wanted. Uh, you know, I wasn't as interested in it, um, but I was actually really fascinated by some of my controls classes, um, getting into the labs and actually, you know, making that inverted pendulum stand up and then eventually moving on to things like controlling quad rotors, uh, building estimators and in, in the decision algorithms lab. For, that, for me, that was huge and really pointed me towards uh, controls as sort of the uh, my area of specialization um, and basically uh, since then I've been I've been really involved with that kind of took that into my career and um, started uh, started down that path and have been just going down there ever since. So it was uh, kind of kind of cool to have that opportunity to, to find that that niche while I was at the UI and, and then carry that out uh, as the kind of launching point for my career. Yeah, so from my end, I definitely didn't have anything uh, explicitly identified, especially when I was like a freshman or sophomore uh, doing my bachelor's, nothing was uh, you know, I was open to everything and open to taking classes. And uh, and then, you know, I, I distinctly remember, I think for, for most standard schedules, uh, junior year is what hits you like a ton of bricks all at once. And uh, I had the big fortune of having uh, Professor Bedoni uh, teach me compressible fluid dynamics, which I think uh, a lot of people probably kicked them out of fluids forever in that way. But uh, for me, <laughs> For me, I actually, I actually really enjoyed it. It was extremely challenging, of course, and I wanted to die that semester, but it was great. It ended up really great uh, because, you know, I finally, like, I found this topic that, number one, the math was extremely interesting and very complex, but also had a lot of, like, real-world applications. Um, and also, uh, I had the semi-disappointment of getting to, like, the end of senior year and every fluids teacher saying, we can't solve any of these problems without computers. So let's let's turn to that direction. And so that was really fun because I've always been into computers ever since I was young. And uh, I picked up programming in college. I didn't take any classes in programming, even though that's kind of what I do now all the time. Uh, 
so that really appealed to me, like the, the connection between you've got a lot of math and physics, but you've also got computers and software mixed in. And for me, that was a great mix. I know for a lot of people, it's a, that's a terrible mix. But for me, it was a really good mix. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so stepping into where you guys are at right now in your companies, I know different aerospace companies call their groups different things. And um, you've probably experienced some of that. Um, you know, sometimes there is a propulsion group and there is a aerodynamics group. Sometimes they're organized slightly differently. So can you describe, you know, what group you fit into and what kinds of roles at your company exist within that group? And then, you know, which, which piece of that you are actually a part of and, and, you know, doing as part of your job? Uh, I guess I should start first. Um, well, my company, I think all of in, anyone on this call the guys who are already working and the, the kids, you guys need to notice, these companies change dramatically as time goes on. Um, my company was huge when I came when I came to it. It was Vought Aircraft. I'm not sure if none, none of you re remember what Legacy Vault was. There, there's a, it was a company over here by this naval base in Dallas, and they actually used to fly jets out here. Um, we got Lockheed over in Fort Worth, and they, they do more of that now. They used to be General Dynamics. But when I first hired in at, at um, Watt, it was a company that dealt with manufacturing airplanes, but actually building, testing, and selling those planes to the government. As time went on, they just started to do more um, assembly work on the structure side of it. So in, in my own experience, that's, that's basically where this, the, the company's focus was in the first place. So I started off as an engineer here and then kind of went up the chain in um, different levels where you would be just an analyst. Um, you will work for someone, someone smart, hopefully, <laughs> but you will work for someone. They would, they would help you out, put you through the ropes. You'll get training at the company because unfortunately, just like some of these guys are going to tell you, a lot of the stuff that we learn in college does not apply here in general. It really is something that kind of gets you ready to learn how to do real world applications. And then once you get that a foundation, they sweep a lot of the stuff that you, you, uh, you learned and they started putting the company's methods into effect, at least from a structure side. So one of the things that I think is really important, I'm kind of diverging here, but I will say this, whatever you do in college, do a good job of it. Um, the, the, the thing that, people want to see when they when you get out of here is they want to see that you can apply yourself and be successful at what you do and can understand difficult concepts because once you get out into the real world those concepts become real you know people lives depend on what you do you know money is going to be a big factor in it for the company and for your society so make sure you do that and basically that's kind of the the direction that my career took. And right now I am an MRB structures lead engineer. I'm currently the only stress analyst at the at Carbon. Um, we had maybe four or 500 stress engineers at one point. <laughs> so that can give you an idea of how things can change as you progress through your career. So for me, Blue Origin is really split up into two major business units. And so you've got the rocket side that is all the manufacturing of the rockets and everything there. And then you have the engine side, right? Um, and so my team is kind of on the support end. We're called test and flat operations, where basically I, me and my team, around 30 engineers and technicians, we're responsible for receiving all of the engines connecting it to the test stand facility, and we're responsible for all the test operations. Um, once we finish test operations, depending whether it's development, qualification, acceptance testing, you know, doesn't matter, it depends on the specific engine. Once all of that is complete, you know, demate the engine and we ship it off to the next business unit, whether it's going to the rocket, whether it's going back to can for repairs or more development upgrades. So we're, we're kind of like a, like a little, we're in the middle where we interface with both business units at the same time, right? Where our product is data, right? As a test stand. And so we, we're giving that data to engines, we're giving that data to the rocket 
Um, and so we're interfacing with all those teams at all times uh, as a test facility. And so where I can, me and my team kind of fit in that role is we run that test facility, we run the operations, we run the training for test conductors, and ultimately we're responsible for the health of the facility, the hardware, the test article, and all the people on the test team. And so it's been really interesting because when you come in you're basically a trainee so you're you're not allowed to touch any buttons you're not allowed to do any projects without have like four people looking over your shoulder right and so we have these things that are called stand boards where you know after six months you'll sit down with five other test engineers that are all certified and they're going to grill you on everything you know and then they'll say okay maybe you can touch a few buttons without people looking over your shoulder and then you finally do that a couple of times and you reach what's what we call a safety operator where you're the highest level certified. And so that's where you run the test facility. You're running the test. You're the final go, no go for that day. And you're responsible for all the people on the test stand. So it's, I think it's a really unique position because you know, I'm, I'm only 26 and to be able to work with a team of 30 people and say, you know, I'm comfortable testing. I'm the one given to go, you know? So it's, I think it's a really, really cool job and, and company where we're able to do that. Yeah, on um, on the Archer side, uh, we call our group guidance, navigation and controls. A lot of aerospace companies call this uh, flight controls or, or uh, in some cases it's like handling qualities. Um, we really we really kind of span a pretty wide spectrum of like um, what actually happens in regards to uh, stretching a little bit towards the aerodynamic side, a little bit towards the software side. Um, a lot towards the test side and a lot of data analysis. And that's all just sort of stuff that's um, external to the core development of control systems. Uh, that, that's really the main, the main part of our job. So um, yeah, like on a, you know, on a day to day basis, our team is doing everything from building simulation models uh, and then verifying that with flight data, um, actually designing the control algorithms, uh, in some cases, designing estimation algorithms. Uh, actually like writing down the physics, uh, which, which surprisingly is in some ways very similar to things that we've done uh, in, in school and coursework. Uh, but then you get to see all the, all the real elements of how that happens in the real world. And uh, you know, the, those equations are of course always idealized. So you get to really learn about how all the real world effects uh, start to dominate in, in many of those ways. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting because you get to sort of see, um, I, I think it was cool kind of seeing how those first principles uh, bear out into, into the real world and then being able to see where, where all the second and third order effects come in as well. Um, but that's that's all kind of related to, um, all sort of related to the things that we do when we're building these controllers. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot of work with analysis as well. So being able to go in and um, prove that a lot of the, the work that we're doing is, is safe and that we're, we're actually gonna fly an aircraft that's not gonna crash or, or under some failure condition perform, perform poorly. Um, the team really does interface with a lot of the other groups, as I mentioned, but um, we're, we're super involved with also testing the aircraft. I think that's one of the most fun parts of, of being a GNC or flight controls engineer is actually being able to say, hey, this is you know, everything, all the sort of flight behavior, everything that's going on when this, when this vehicle is, is flying is, is due to the control algorithms and, and due to them performing well. And it's, it's very obvious when it doesn't. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool uh, a cool role that you get to be very multidisciplinary, um, and you can kind of uh, shape that in whichever way you want. I tend to be a little bit more software oriented, so I tend to work a little bit more on the software side. But there's definitely people who um, who tend to gravitate towards some of the other um, uh, some of the other elements and, and may lean more towards uh, the flight dynamics side or or the aerodynamics. So uh, yeah, it's a really wide field, and, and it's really cool to kind of be able to to see a lot of the different elements of what makes an aerospace vehicle fly. Yeah, so from my end, um, I'm part of the, what's called the Computational Aerosciences Branch at NASA Ames. And uh, we're part of a sort of larger code T, uh, like larger scope of Ames and Ames fits in to the entire superstructure of NASA. And, uh, you know, there's, I, I can't actually comment too much about sort of the differences uh, in our structure compared to like uh, private sector because I've actually never worked in private sector. But um, for our part, uh, there is a lot of government in government. And so for, for us and for people who work, uh, who I'm usually working with, we don't usually interface with sort of team leads of other teams 
because uh, my boss and my boss's boss, et cetera, will do all of that. And my boss really wants us to stay focused on our work and not necessarily have to focus on sort of the like dealing with the contracts, the fun and all that stuff. So they handle that. And in our end, you know, we interface with a lot of different people. Uh, some of the projects that I work on are actually uh, projects that Lockheed is pursuing. I was recently working on a uh, stuff that SpaceX was pursuing. So we, you know, we go through all of that. Uh, and, you know, for my end, I've been at NASA Ames almost two years now. And my team is roughly 30 people. And for these CFD teams, I mean, they really range in the full range. My team is actually very small, I would say, for a CFD team of like, it, it was 20 uh, going on 30 now. But you have some of these larger CFD teams that, uh, like Langley, et cetera, that'll have 50 to 100 people that are working on the software and applying stuff with that software. And so for me, fitting into a smaller team has, has uh, ups and downs because as part of a smaller team, you're sort of responsible for more of a share of what the group is doing. And so I have to wear a lot of hats a lot of times, uh, whereas maybe in a larger team, you wouldn't. Um, but for my end, uh, also because I'm still newer, like two years in, it's still kind of newer in, in NASA's experience. And so I'm still work primarily working on applications, et cetera. Um, as, you, as you get more experience and, and sort of further up in the team and in the group and in the branch, et cetera, you get more down into the weeds of like developing algorithms and developing the software and doing more fundamental research. But where I am right now for the first couple of years, it's almost entirely applications and doing studies uh, using CFD, not so much the development side. Although luckily my, my boss and everybody in the team is extremely receptive to when people express, oh, I have an interest in, in this area, I have an interest in, in, in this application, et cetera. They're extremely receptive to that. They'll move you around and they'll try to find, you know, where do your interests overlap with what the group's doing and try to find harmony there. And I think it's interesting that you say 30 is a small CFD team. That's a huge CFD team by, by my private company standards. If I get two CFD guys, I'm usually like, yeah, somebody can check your work. That's great. So that's funny. Um, okay, so so I'm going to ask you guys like the, the quintessential, what is it, like office space question of like, what would you say it is that you do? That's where we're going to go next. So I want you to think about your average day, not your most exciting day, not your worst day, but walk us through what are you actually doing at work? What does that look like when you walk into the office and you sit down at a laptop or something else? Uh, what are you doing? Okay, so I guess I'll go again. Um, well, I'm, I'm working more off site lately. So, you know, I turn it on, turn my computer on, and I look in, in what we call a mechanical engineering system. And I see if there are any issues that are that have popped up on the floor, on the manufacturing floor. Um, again, I'm I'm currently an MRB engineer on various programs in the company. So it can be an Embraer, Global Hawk, uh, V22, it could be anything. And uh, if there is something that is showing up, then I have to examine that what we call a tag, a withholding tag. Um, and I have to determine a solution to the problem. Uh, there's another engineer who gives a disposition to try to repair whatever that problem is. They may have uh, tore a hole through it in some form or fashion. They may have a non-conformance that will affect flight, whatever the situation is. It has to come through me and I have to come up with a, a acceptance of that disposition. Or if I disagree with what he's presented or he or she has presented, I have to come up with a new disposition. And those are some really important decisions. Um, some of these parts, some of these parts can be uh, 100, 200 thousand dollar parts. And as an engineer, you cannot make a decision based on cost. You have to make a decision based on if it will fulfill its intended function. Because again, we're dealing in aerospace, and if it doesn't, you can have a failure, and you don't want to have a structural failure on any planes out there. So that, that's the type of thing that I work on. So once I make that disposition, I log it in and I send it on to, to the next group, the quality group, uh, the production group. They fund, they go through it and take my approval, repair it, 
and then the customer is notified of that when it's shipped to them that this condition exists. And by our contract, they agree to it up front for the most part. And then it gets on the plane. And while that's happening, other stuff is coming up too. Um, I think I want to expand just a little bit though, because, because of my experience and how many things I've been working on over these 23 years, in aerospace, your function changes as you go on. So in, in structures, you, you have what we call a development phase. And in a development phase, you may have a new program, for instance, like some of these guys were talking about, where you have to create some of these um, parts, some of these structures, in my case, based on requirements that are supplied to you by the custom. These are creations. So once you do that and everything is tested, everything meets the requirements, you got to go through a lot of government oversight or commercial oversight based on which, which one you're doing. Once all those tests are completed, then you have another phase where you have what we call a sustainment phase. And this is true in most, and in, in, in I can't think of any engineering it's not true in, where you have design and production. So once you go through the sustainment phase, you literally have to sustain the design that you were um, asked to perform. And in the sustainment side, there's even more engineering opportunity because just because it was designed and approved initially does not mean it's right. As time goes on, you may have problems that come up with the design. And I'm sure you've seen that in aircraft service bulletins where things didn't work as they intended it to work. And then you have to redesign that structure or you have to find ways of solving those problems where it won't be a redesign, but it'll be a, some type of continual repair. And then after that, now you have to look at some other issues. So those are the type of day-to-day -day things I deal with because I'm looking at development issues, I'm looking at sustainment issues, and I'm looking at production issues on the floor. Cool. So for me, there really isn't a normal day, right? In dev and test stops, just because things can go crazy, you know, at any point, but. Uh, ideally, uh, when I come in in the morning, I have a meeting basically with the whole uh, supervisor team and the other test engineers, and we make a plan with the propulsion engineers that are part of a, part of the engines organization and say, okay, are we testing today? Is that the goal of the day? And if they say yes, then I go and start running test operations, where that's basically, I'm bringing the whole facility online. I'm bringing up high pressure gases. I'm bringing up you know, let's say I have, I have storage tanks full of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and my run tanks are low that go to the engine. I got to fill those up and get ready for test. Um, I'm checking out valve. There's a couple thousand components across a test stand, right? Whether it's pressure transducers, valves, actuators, accelerometers, everything, right? And so while I'm running operations, if I see something that I know is test critical that isn't working, I'm going to mark that down and know I have to go back to it and make sure we get that working before test. So there's a lot of troubleshooting involved every single day. We're going to see off nominal things and you're going to have to make the decision whether, you know, do we need this for test? Can we proceed without it right now? Because test cadence is, is you hear that a hundred times a day, right? You know, we need the data, we need the data, we need the data. So you're always trying to push and figure out, you know, what, what can I do to get us to test as soon as possible so we can get that data. And, you know, that puts us on schedule to get into the next test quicker and quicker. Um, and then up to doing the actual test itself, uh, we run with uh, another two, it's three test engineers, a propulsion engineer and an instrumentation engineer. So you're the only ones allowed in the control room and you're basically communicating while you're all running the same parallel operations. Um, and it's, it's cool to say I get to press the big button that actually starts the test. That's, that's my favorite part. Um, and then once, once the test is all good to go, it's basically securing the facility, right? So purging out different lines, right? You know, if, you know, something happened on the engine, I need a propulsion guy to go in and, and inspect the turbo pump, right? I need to make sure it's clear of all hydrogen that was in that line. So there's a lot of saving that goes on at all times and making sure it's safe for personnel, safe for propulsion engineers to work on the engine, safe for technicians to troubleshoot different systems. Even if it was like a small valve that was that was leaky, right? I need to make sure that that valve and whole system's isolated for him to be safe to work on it, right? Um, and so that's that's kind of like a normal day where it's you're, you're running test operations for like 75% of it and the rest is troubleshooting. 
And so if we have a down day, it's kind of where we go into doing maintenance, right? Test and maintenance, maintenance on our, your tanks, components, uh, verifying that all your instrumentation is in calibration. Uh, accuracy is a really, really big deal when you're trying to get your mass flow and ISP calculations for your engines. And then there's also things on um, kind of that are more system side, right? Where you, you have test readiness reviews, you have data reviews with the engines teams and the rocket teams and that you have to present and you have to present the data and, you know, and you got to tell them, you know, did facility have an issue on the last test? Is there anything we need to fix? Is there anything that they need to do to support to make sure that you're ready for test again? And then there's always new things coming up too, right? Which is, which is, I think is really exciting. Like you'll just get an email one day and say, Hey, I want to put an engine and a whole new test cell. What's it going to take? Here's my mass flow rates. Here's my pressures. I got six months and $2 million. What can we do? Right. And, and so like you're, you're going to be that person that's, you're like, okay, let's, you know, meet, figure out what we got to do. And you, you start going through requirements, right? Everyone's favorite word, <laughs> you know, you start, start from there and start going down, you know, what, what can the facility do? What can we provide? What the schedule look like? So it's, you know, it's as when you start as a test engineer, you're like hundred percent ops. When, when you start getting to the higher levels, it's, it's, like 50% ops and maintenance and the rest is a lot of systems work interfacing with different teams um, and things like that. Yeah, definitely uh, got to echo a little bit of what Derek and Florence said with, uh, you know, th there's definitely uh, different days which have totally different uh, roles and especially, I think it's especially true working at a uh, smaller company. Um, at Archer, our, our GMT team is, is currently nine people, which is, which is one of the bigger ones I've worked on. Uh, since I've since I've left the real big aerospace, um, but yeah, it, it it can vary a lot. So on on a day one, I'm focusing on development. It might be that you know we've got some features we need to get built for our flight control software. Um, I might be working on uh, building models in MATLAB and Simulink, um, testing those out in our simulation environment, and then um, you know writing test cases to make sure that all that's going to work in all of our corner conditions. Um, then if it's, uh, it might be a day where we're doing some flight testing on our subscale aircraft, I might actually be um, preparing code to get loaded onto that aircraft, actually going out to the field and, and supervising that test, briefing, uh, briefing our test team on exactly what's going to happen, what we expect uh, the aircraft, how we expect it to fly or how we expect it to behave. And then really the most important part of this is what could possibly go wrong, right? So uh, being prepared for, oh, you know, there's, I'm pretty sure this is going to work, but there's a chance that the roll loop goes unstable and you might start seeing oscillations. We see those wings rocking more than 10 degrees. We're going to knock it off, you know, take manual control and we'll land the aircraft. So um, there's also the full scale flight testing, which, which is even more exciting, but much slower, um, you know, we're a lot more deliberate and making sure that uh, we're able to communicate uh, exactly what we, uh, what we expect the aircraft to do under all conditions. Um, depending on winds, we might have different um, different behaviors to expect. So being able to go through all the details and have make sure everyone's 100% prepared by the time that we actually go and fly an aircraft, it's experimental, uh, is super important. And then obviously being there, being there to watch the data in real time and, and make sure that, um, make sure things are behaving correctly and being able to make a call that, hey, we need to knock this test off because things are starting, uh, starting to look anomalous or, or not exactly as planned. Um, and being able to make those judgment calls of, of whether something uh, does uh, does require us to, to end the test or to come back. Um, and then on the flip side of that is once tests are done, there's a lot of data analysis. So I might be sitting in my computer um, looking at uh, the log of a the flight. There might be hundreds of hundreds or thousands of signals that I could potentially look at, but knowing, hey, which ones do we need to focus on on this test? Um, we know that uh, we were exercising, you know, maybe new gains on some controllers. So I might need to go in and look hey, you know, what were those, uh, what were those controllers doing? Were the integra integrators performing correctly for our filters, um, you know, uh, the appropriate cutoff frequency and really being able to, to look at that data and show that um, we're meeting all of our stability margins and that we're good to continue to the next test point um, is, is super important. So yeah, there's, there's kind of different phases from, from designing to testing to actually like analyzing the data and then Doing that all in the iterative cycle and, uh, and being able to, to improve on our designs and our aircraft as, uh, as we go. Uh, and then a big part of it is also working with, with other, other teams um, in aerospace. Everything's interconnected. So uh, being able to, to work with, with other teams to either solve problems or to come up with, um, to come with, come up with interesting solutions to things that, uh, that, that come up in testing is, is always a big part of our day. Um, and 
because these are big programs, there's all, there always ends up being some work on, you know, building schedules. Uh, if you're working on uh, leading a project, you might be responsible for actually communicating with other engineers and making sure that they're sort of um, working on the right things, setting priorities, and then, um, you know, whenever there's real issues that need to be communicated at the company level, being able to present those and really communicate things effectively, um, like verbally, as well as through presentations or, or emails. So but that's all, that all kind of goes into the day to day. So for me, I can sort of uh, talk about uh, kind of the current project that I'm actually working on. It serves as kind of a good microcosm for sort of what, what it's like to work as a CFD engineer. Um, currently, uh, Lockheed Martin is developing uh, a concept airplane that'll fly supersonic. It's a commercial supersonic jet meant to fly passengers. And so Lockheed will do their own CFD on this thing because the structures team wants to know the loads on it. The stability team wants to know how does this thing fly, et cetera. Everybody wants to know something about it. And so they'll do their CFD and then they'll say, hey, this is a conceptual vehicle that's never flown ever. So we, our CFD, we don't have any, we have no idea if the CFD is correct or, or, or even reality at all. And so they'll give it to NASA, they'll give it to whoever, and they'll say, hey, can you run this? Can you, can you also run your CFD on it and see how you compare with us? And so we'll do that. And so for my team, we'll get, the vehicle from Lockheed, uh, and we'll we'll have to build a mesh on it, right? Which could be really easy if you do Cartesian meshes, or it could be really complex if you use like overset meshes. And then you will decide on sort of a design space. For instance, if we're doing something that the controls and the GNC people are interested in, we'll have to run like a full alpha sweep and try to understand, okay, how are the moments on the vehicle affected by its various flight conditions, et cetera. So you might be running uh, anywhere from two to 200 cases uh, on different different atmospheric conditions, different flight envelopes, et cetera. And so all of that uh, is something that I could be doing. I could be running some of those cases. Or uh, in fact, not much of my time is actually spent running cases because running cases for me just means put it into the supercomputer and it will do all that work. But then I'll get back all of this data. Like one of the, one of the other projects I'm working on right now, the data space for that is like on the order of 200 cases. And so you'll have to design, you know, your own methods of like, how do I collect all this data? Where am I gonna put it? You can't do it all in the supercomputer because there's limited space and CPU power on that thing. So you gotta bring it down and figure out, okay, how am I gonna process it over here? And then the hard part, right? You have to po post-process all this data and like draw some conclusions. Like uh, at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're trying to inform the designers of these kinds of things. like. How is your design? Is your design great or does it need some work? And so we have to collect together all of our information and, and really make some conclusions, some like tangible conclusions that are gonna be sent to the design teams or the analysis teams or the other CFD teams and say, like, this is what we did, this is what we found. So act on that how you will. And so I've been involved in like every step of that process, whether it's from the meshing, the running, the post-processing, doing all the systems that are that facilitate all those things. Uh, those are all things that I handle, and even in just my first year, et cetera. So it's really exciting to do that, and, and yeah. Awesome. So just looking at the time, I think I'm going to ask each of you basically one more question that has two sub questions. So, and this one maybe try to keep brief if you can, just to to so we can leave some time for questions. So I'm going to ask you, what is one thing that you learned at UIUC? aerospace that has helped you in your career and what is one thing you wish you had learned that would have helped you in your career had you already known it going into it hmm. it's a very good question um as i said in in, in the introduction um the uh design class that we had I, I, I still don't remember what it was specifically but what we had to help design a spaceship i mean that that really tied into um, my career path. Um, now, as far as on the other side of it, um, once I got into industry, I didn't really talk about this because it's really high, high, high order stuff, and it would take longer than five minutes to talk about it. But the analysis methods that we use, um, we use what um, we call Broom. It's a good reference. Um, new. 
It's a good reference. Uh, Rourke, stress, stress analysis. Peterson's. When I was at U of I, we didn't have a class that really de uh, dove into those uh, references. I, ca I can't even remember what book we were using. <laughs> Excuse me. But, but basically, those are the books that, that are used by industry. And they, they are still used by industry to this day. Uh, a lot of the industry methods um, for their stress analysis requirements key in on analyses from those books, even in 2022. And a lot of those references were from the 70s and 80s. So hopefully U of I has kind of added that to their course work, course descriptions. But those references are, are paramount and they would have prepared us a little bit better. Um, I will say one more thing that in those, those references that were at U of I at the time I went, which is a while back, we were dealing more with um, theory, formulas, that type of thing. Whereas Broom, Newey, and these other books, they deal with actually actual application to, to the real world. And that is something that's very much needed in any engineering discipline. That should, that should start in sophomore year, actually, rather than the junior, senior year for most of us. So for me, I think, I'm not sure if there was really a class or, or something that, that happened that U of I really enabled me to be successful. I think it was the department as a whole. And so when I came in to U of I, I started a student club called Student Space Systems, where we wanted to build the first suborbital, completely student-built rocket. Um, and so it was actually the department that helped us get funding, get access to professors and lectures and lab space, all the tools we needed. And so I was able to work on hybrid and liquid rocket engines while still at college, which I think that that was the biggest setup for success. And I see Laura is is in the chat, so I just want to give a shout out to Laura Gerald because we couldn't have done it without her back then, along with uh, you know Dr. Woodard, Professor Gabel, Diane Jeffers, like they were all just instrumental in in setting us up for success back then, and, and really getting experience before uh, you know rolling into test operations. Like I, if I came in fresh, I think it would have been a lot harder. And for me, I think the the part that I struggle with the most is electrical engineering. So like like when I see a pressure transducer out, I'm like, oh, time to ask one of the, the INC guys to help me on it, right? And so it's, I wish I took either maybe more, more of those classes or paid more attention in them for sure. Yeah, on, on my side, um, really I had uh, a lot of good experiences with sort of the design work we did both in our like senior design coursework, uh, being able to work on a team that's multidisciplinary is is really huge because that's what you do realistically every day when you're when you're in a lot of rooms in aerospace, especially in GNC. Um, so that was that was a really great experience. One of the things that uh, perhaps I uh, didn't learn as much of, um, or at least through U of I that I thought would have been more helpful, is having more of a software background. I think increasingly many jobs in aerospace require you to have some knowledge of software. If you're on the structure side, you might be running. Uh, you might want to automate some of your uh, structural analyses on the aerodynamic side, um, as Scott was talking about, a lot of coding for CFD. Um, and even if you're doing testing, you might want to, you might want to be writing scripts or run some of your tests or even analyze some of the data uh, or even write you know, some simple things for protection. So on the GNC side, obviously, it's a lot of developing flight software. And just being, having a really strong software background, I think, is, is going to be increasingly important going forward as that starts to bleed into everyone's, everyone's jobs in aerospace. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, Derek hit the nail on the head earlier, actually, that um, one of the things that U of I gave best, I think, is not, not so much uh, the material itself, but how you approach different material and how you can learn material on your own some degree. Uh, I'll tell you one of the biggest unutilized resources uh, when you're in college and when you're an undergrad is the professors. I think nobody should be sleeping on like office hours. Those things are amazing. And I definitely did not go to enough. Like I only went to a couple, probably in my whole bachelor's. Huge mistake. You, these professors are there to help you. They love when students come in. Their doors are like wide open all the time. And so just going in and talking, it doesn't even be about material, like just anything. These guys are great. 
and you i would i'd be talking to them more often and they have such great perspective on the material and also how to learn the material because they've gone through it into such a nth degree that they'll have a lot of perspective on like how to learn anything and then to echo the other point uh one thing that it, that it didn't teach because it couldn't is software and programming i personally don't think that like languages and particular um tools on the computer are like amenable to like being taught in a university class this kind of thing and so you know i i came into u of i and even graduated u of i knowing almost zero python c plus plus or fortran and yet i'm using python c plus plus and fortran pretty much every day it's like 90 percent of what i'm doing right and i didn't know it at that time and i could have been studying it at that time i didn't really need to i guess but i could have been and i think that would have been really helpful uh and again i can't blame the department or the professors for not teaching it because i don't think they I don't think it's useful to like teach coding or languages. I think that's something you can pick up on your own. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something I wish I had, I had had more of even today is like just just more time to have learned software and programming, et cetera. Perfect. All right. So we'll open it up. If anyone online has questions for a specific person or for the group, um, you can either type them in the chat or Unmute and ask away. Okay, I guess I'll ask a question. Can everybody hear me? I hope. Okay. Also, hi, Florin. <laughs> um, so I guess it's picking back and piggybacking off the last question, but. For all of you, what was the hardest part of transitioning from your undergrad, either into industry or, I guess, for some of you, your master's into industry? Um, and yeah, what what do you wish that you knew before kind of jumping um, off of academia directly into the industry? Well, I, I think we've all kind of outlined it a little bit. Um, the the hardest thing for me was the the real world applications of what I learned um, in some of those courses not not meeting the requirement for you know real world applications um again most times when you come out you 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 may know the theory but then you get in there and they 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 kind of shake that out of you because you really have to be looking at things from a test perspective like florin has been talking about as well you got to test this stuff to see if it's right and sometimes you find that this theory may say this, but in the real world, when you test it, it's it it doesn't fly. So then, then we come up with you know, some 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 fudging numbers to make them work, <laughs> so we can still use some of the theory. But that that was the the thing that I, I thought that I needed most um, was that, and and also what Scott kind of referred to. I, I didn't mention this, but he hit he hit the nail on the head. Um, the software issue when I when I came out and started working. We were dealing with thousands of cases, and I and I've had experience working at Lockheed. I worked there for ten years on JSF, and we were given like seven thousand conditions as a stress analyst. They said, "Okay, go break this down and see see what's most see what's the worst cases." And if you didn't have and and I had to learn how to write scripts, learn how to write the software on my own, so I can make sure I understood it. And I used Excel a lot, you know, was able to automate some of those spreadsheets. But those are the types of things that you really have to uh try to get understand once you get out because you really aren't prepared for that when you're in college so those are the those are the biggest transitions and i think most most engineers who were able to navigate that they, they became and pretty successful because being able to write those scripts and being able to do that analysis that you need to do whatever your discipline is <clears throat> it saves time and it allows you to focus on other issues and allows you to do your work very well I can go next. Yeah. So for me, I think the, the biggest transition was, and this might be really unique to the dev environment where, you know, we're in, in school, you're, th you're taught like, here's the problem. You go, you do your homework, write everything down, figure it all out. And then you come here and you're like, we have an hour to fix this, right? You know, whatever the problem is, right? So it's, it's about making fast paced decisions, right? Where you have like 50 or 70% of the information and you have a few assumptions, right? And it's also learning about when to ask for help, I think is a big one, right? Usually, I think in school, you're telling like, here's your homework, you're going to go do it. But then when you come into industry, you, I think you learn really quickly that you're a team, 
and you're, there's people there to help you and support you. And when you have a problem and you're not, you're stuck, it's okay to go and ask someone more senior for help, right? And that's that's what you should be doing if, if you're ever stuck. So I think that it, t- it took me a while, you know, a few months in the job to be like, you know, I don't have to prove myself. There's nothing to prove here. I already have the job, you know, let me, let me go ask for help and we can figure it out and, and get these projects moving faster. So that was, that was a really tough transitional change for me from kind of like the academic environment into the, like the really fast paced uh, dev environment. Yeah, kind of well, echo what Florian said and kind of navigating the structure of companies and understanding where you can turn for help is uh, was definitely a big transition point. Uh, obviously in, in uh, school, you have certain resources you can lean on, um, TAs, office hours, certain campus resources, but when you're at a company that that's completely different. You know, you may have more senior coworkers, technical leads, your manager, uh, potentially mentors outside of your group, and being able to sort of understand all those different resources and how you can use them uh, definitely takes a little bit of time. And it's a, it's a really important thing to understand, but uh, definitely in, in the beginning, especially working at a really large company, at, like I was at Boeing when I first started, uh, that was that was definitely a challenge. Um, and understanding that really helped me to um, to grow and be more successful in my job. Yeah, so uh, I think I think a lot of what I wanted to say has been has been covered, but I think one other aspect that was uh, a big transition for me uh, is that when you're in school and your success is determined by sort of your performance on like assignments and homework and tests, et cetera, that you're pretty much working on the same thing as everybody around you is working on. And so if you're stuck, you can go to somebody else and somebody else says, oh yeah, I solved that part. You know, I can, they can help you. But uh, In the sector that I'm in, you know, there's so much work to be done that a certain amount of work will be given to you and you're expected to do it. And it's not like if you hit a sticking point, you can just, hey, someone else is working on this exact thing. There's not, right? You're doing that thing. And so if you get stuck, you're stuck and you need to get yourself out of it. And like others have said, like you still have all these resources, right? You still have all your coworkers, you have all your superiors, you have people more experienced than you, et cetera that you can go to for help, but you need to have sort of some confidence and conviction and a sense of responsibility as well that you're given some some tasks to do and you've got to do them, right? There's nobody else is going to come in. You can't be like tanking a homework assignment and just say, I'm burning this one, man, I'll get the next one, right? No, you can't. Like You're giving your work and you got to do it. So uh, yeah, learning your resources and navigating that space, I think is is pretty big. Yeah, thank you all. I see a hand raise. You want to go for it, Tom? Yeah, I had a couple of questions for uh, Florin. Um, Florin, did I hear correctly at the beginning in your intro, you said you did uh, an internship at SpaceX first before your your post-grad job at Blue Origin. Is that right? Yeah, I was out in McGregor doing test stops for a semester. Okay, so I have sort of like two questions for you. Um, The first one is, uh, do you know if you're having had that internship experience, was that a factor in Blue Origin, you know, deciding to hire you? And, you know, did that internship experience help prepare you for your Blue Origin job in any ways? Oh, absolutely. I mean, getting when I was at that internship, I was able to kind of see test operations firsthand. And so I was involved on everything from receiving the Falcon stage prepping it for tests, prepping all the Merlins, running down maintenance work orders, working JIRA issue tickets. Um, I wasn't a lot around the test operations themselves. I was just a lot of shadow, but just seeing how like the console screens work, learning how like the vet lab view interface work was really cool and kind of went into it. And so I think that experience definitely helped me get a job with Blue Origin for sure. And I know as you know, as us as companies being competitors, you know, they're definitely, you know, they're always trying to poach us and we're always trying to poach them. So I think, I think as if anyone who sees SpaceX on a resume is going to be interested, I think same with Blue Origin or any other kind of like big, big aero company right now. And how did you go about getting your internship? Was that something you did on your own? Was that something that the department stressed or is that something that just the college as a whole uh stressed or introduced you to 
Yeah, I think throughout every year the college really stressed going to career career fairs and events like that. And I think for me, I just tried every single year. I just applied on their website. And I think that by being able to do test operations at a college level with the department. So by that point, I've already successfully tested a couple of hybrid engines and wrote all the test operations for those. And uh, we're well on our way towards our uh, CDR, you know, our critical design review on our liquid engine. And so I think when I, that was when I was at the end of my junior year. And so I think it was finally that experience that pushed it over the edge. And it was a random day in the summer that I got a call and they're like, do you want to come test engines to McGregor? And it was 20 minute interview. It was, it was that fast and that's all it took. And I was out there in a week. <laughs> I was supposed to start my senior year and a week later I was in McGregor doing that co-op. Thanks. All right, Courtney, it doesn't look like there's anything else, but if people do have questions, um, are they okay to reach out to you? And then you can pass things on to our presenters here if needed. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you to our four presenters. Um, great session. I'm so glad you were all able to join us today. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for all of our students who are, who are on today. I put a um, link in the chat. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, um, it's just a real quick form to let us know what you thought uh, today and also your opportunity to give us input on what topics you would like to hear in these Illini Aero uh, Connection series. So um, please give us that feedback. It'll, it'll help shape the future of this program. So uh, thank you again to our presenters. And um, oh, uh, real quick, uh, next up, we do have another Illini Aero Connections uh, series planned, and that is going to happen in early April. We're still... Um, Still determining the exact date on that, but once I get that confirmed, we're going to be speaking with um, Rick Zelinka and Greg Mayer, who are both intellectual property attorneys, um, work in that realm, and they'll talk to you about patents and intellectual property and all that goes along with that. So um, that's all we have for today. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Thanks. Yeah, nice to meet you, you guys.